Ja? ja. Good evening. We begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed are thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now that they are over dead. Amen. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Our garden angels, pray for us. Our saint patrons, pray for us. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. So we begin now after this short introduction about uh, the sources, uh, historical sources of the um, spirituality. We will begin with um, the introduction about the perfection of Christian life. So we are giving a a series of conferences about ascetical and mystical theology and the proper object of this branch of the theology is the perfection of the Christian life. So what is it um, as the first uh, introduction? God of all goodness vouchsafed, guaranteed to us, not only the natural life of the soul, but also a supernatural life, the life of grace. And this latter life is a sharing of God's very life. As we have shown uh, we, before already when we were speaking about supernatural life. Because this life was given us through the merits of our Lord Jesus Christ, and because he is its most perfect example cause, we call it rightly the Christian life. So it is a participation on the life of God, but through our Lord Jesus Christ, the merits, he is the way, the only way to God. All life must n- needs be perfected and it is perfected perfected by pursuing its end and this life is most important because it is our destiny we have not other destiny heaven and a part of the heaven is the hell so that is not a, an option so it, this supernatural life is very important, so its perfection is very important. Absolute perfection means the actual attainment of that end. So it is, uh, as you know, um, not only dying in the state of grace, so we can go to heaven, but also in the highest degree of holiness, uh, wherefore God created us and that's the the actual attainment of that end this will this we shall attain only um, definitely as I said in heaven and it's forever there through the beatific vision and pure love we shall possess God and our life will have its complete development. Then we shall be like unto God, 
because we shall see him as he is. For instance, uh, Our Lady uh, is in heaven, Our Lady Mary is in heaven, and she participates in this divine line, in the glory, divine life in the glory, and she is responsible for, for the distribution of all graces. She is the mediator, uh, the mediator of the, the mediator of all graces, and, and therefore she is uh, uh, occupying with billions of people, billions of people, the persons who are in state of grace to keep them in state of grace and to develop their supernatural life, and um, people who are not in state of grace to to bring them to accept to obtain the state of grace. She occupies with, uh, she's concerned with the souls in purgatory to relieve them. She is occupied with the devils uh, on, who act on earth to restrain, to restrain, to, to uh, oppose them, to control them. She is also occupied with the saints in heaven because she is the queen of all saints and she wants, uh, she wants that. Um, their uh, devotion on earth uh, will be developed. So she is, she is at the main, in the, in the same time, she occupies with billions of uh, persons. How is it possible? Because she participates on the intelligence of God, who knows everything. And she helps these people every, as if she cures only with that one single person. And with all of them, she's doing that. And therefore, she participates also um, on the power of God, the Almight. So she, she knows uh, uh, what God knows, no, not totally, because to know everything that God knows, you have to be God, another person in God, it's not possible. But you see that this um, supernatural life, especially in the glory, is... Um, much more than we thought. St. Paul said it is, uh, it passes, it, um, it is much more than we can imagine and think. And that is the end of that, abs that uh, Christian life. Not only for Our Lady, um, for instance, uh, other saints as uh, St. Ignace of Loyola, uh, St. John of the Cross, St. Anthony of Padua, St. Twitter. There are all these saints who are uh, invoked, uh, called by our prayers. They are occupying also, uh, they are helping us, and they know everything about us and uh, of other people because they participate on the intelligence of God who knows everything. So this is this supernatural life is very important, very, very uh, divine. Here on earth, however, this perfection, this of Christian life, uh, we can reach is only a relative um, in the grace. In this, in the grace, we have participation on the life of God, but we have not this intelligence that we will have as saints have in heaven. This we attain, this perfection on earth, by ever striving after that intimate union with God that fits us for the beatific vision. The grace is for obtaining the glory. The present treatise that we follow here for Father Tanqueray, deals with this relative perfection. After an exposition of general principles on the nature of the Christian life, its perfection, the obligation of striving after it, and the general means of arriving thereat, we shall describe the three ways, purgative, illuminative, and unitive, along which must go all generous souls thirsting for spiritual advancement. So we have first a principle, 
uh, part and then a practical part. First, however, some preliminary questions must be made, made clear in a short introduction. In, uh, in it, we shall treat five questions. The nature of ascetical theology, its sources, we saw already the historical sources, but we see other um, way to present the sources. Its method, its excellence and necessity, excellence and necessity, and its division. So what's the nature, what is the essence, what's the definition of ascetical and mystical theology? In order to show exactly what ascetical theology is, we shall explain the chief names given to it, its relation to the other theological sciences, its relation both with dogma and moral, the distinction between ascetical and mystical theology. Because there's also a sort of ascension in this uh, spiritual life. Uh, first the Assis and then the mystics. So first is different names. The ascetical theology goes by different names. <coughs> it is called the science of the saints, and rightly so, because it comes to us from the saints. <coughs> Thank you. It comes from, uh, to us from the saints. We have seen this with this historical introduction we gave in former uh, conferences. The saints who have taught it more by their life than by word of mouth. Moreover, ascetical theology is calculated to make saints, for it explains to us what sanctity is and what the means are of arriving at it. So it's coming from the saints to make saints, and therefore it's called the science of the saints. Secondly, some have called it spiritual science, because it forms spiritual man, that's to say, man of interior life, animated with God's own spirit. And of course, it is especially and mainly concerned about the soul, uh, that's the spirit. Others have called it the, the art of perfection, for it is really a practical science having for its goal to lead souls to Christian perfection. Again, they have called it the art of arts. And indeed, the highest art is that of perfecting the soul's noblest life is a supernatural life. However, the name most commonly given to it today is that of ascetical and mystical theology. The word ascetical comes from the Greek askesis. It means exercise, effort. It means any arduous task connected with man's education, physical or moral. The Christian perfection, then, implies those efforts that St. Paul himself compares to the training undergone by athletes with the purpose of obtaining the victory. It was therefore natural to designate by the name of ascetism the efforts of the Christian soul struggling to acquire perfection. This is what St. Clement of Alexand Alexandria and Origen did and after them, a great number of the fathers. 
It is not surprising then that his name is of asceticism, asceticism, is given to the science that deals with the efforts necessary to the acquisition of Christian perfection. So our efforts. Sustained, of course, by the grace, because without Jesus, we can do nothing. So our efforts uh, to obtain Christian perfection sustained by grace. Yet, during many centuries, the name that prevailed in designating this science was that of mystical theology, from mystis, mystes, in the Greek word of mysterious, secret, and especially religious secret. Mystes. Because it laid open the secrets of perfection of the Spirit. Later a time arrived when these two words were used in one and the same sense, but the usage that finally obtained was that of restricting the name asceticism to that part of the spiritual science that treats of the first degrees of perfection up to the threshold of contemplation. And the name of mysticism to that other part, which deals with infused or passive contemplation. So mysticism is more the unitive uh, face um, part, the uh, grace with, of God who takes the initiative, and we are following the grace, while ascetism is our efforts sustained by grace. Be that as it may, it follows from all these notions that the science we are dealing with is indeed the science of Christian perfection. This fact allows us to give it a place in the general scheme of theology. So what is its place in theology? One has made more clear the organic unity that holds all to the science of theology than did St. Thomas of Aquinas. He divides his Summa into three parts. In the first, he treats of God as the first principle. He studies him in himself, in the oneness of his nature, in the trinity of his persons, in the works of his creation, preserved and governed by his providence. In the second part, he deals with God as the last end. Towards him, men must go by performing their actions for him under the guidance of the law and the impulse of the grace. By practicing the theological and the moral virtues and by fulfilling the duties peculiar to their state of life. The third part shows us the incarnate word making himself our way. Jesus is the way, our way, whereby we may go to God and instituting the sacraments to communicate to us his grace unto life everlasting. In this plan, ascetical and mystical theology belongs to the second part of the Summa, which with dependence, however, on the two other parts. Later theologians, without setting aside this organic unity of theology, have divided it into three parts, dogmatic, moral, and ascetical. Dogma teaches us what we must believe of God, his divine life, the share in it which he has will to communicate to intelligence creatures, especially to man, the forfeiting of this divine life by origin, original sin, its restoration by the word made flesh, the action of that life on the regenerated soul, its diffusion through the sacraments, and its contemplation in heaven. 
Moral theology shows us how we must respond to this love of God by cultivating the divine life he made us share. It shows us how we must shun sin, practice the virtue, and fulfill those duties of states to which we are strictly bound. And yet, if we wish to perfect that life, designed to go beyond what is strict obligation, and wish to advance systematically in the practice of virtue, it is to ascetical theology that we must turn. So the first, the first part, dogmatic, is what, must, what we must believe. The second one, the moral theology, is what we must do, fundamentally. And the third part is what we must do to get the perfection. Then its relations with moral and dogmatic theology, more in detail. Ascetic theology is a part of the Christian life. In truth, it is most the most noble part, for its purpose is to make us perfect Christians. Although it is it has become a special, distinct part of theology, it holds the closest relations both with dogma and moral. Because its foundation is in dogma. When describing the nature of Christian life, it is from dogma that we seek light. This life being actually a participation in God's life, we must soar up the blessed Trinity itself. There we must find its principle and source so how it was bestowed on our first parents, lost through their fall, and given back by the redeeming Christ. There we must see its organism, its action in our soul, the mysterious channels through which it comes and grows, and how it is finally transformed into the beatific vision in heaven. <clears throat> All these questions are indeed treated in dogmatic theology. But if these truths are not set down once more in a short and clear synthesis, asceticism will seem to be devoid of all foundation. We shall be demanding of souls costly sacrifices without being able to justify these demands by a description of what Almighty God has done for us. In truth, Dogma is fully what Cardinal Manning called it, the fountainhead of devotion. Secondly, ascetic theology also depends on moral theology and completes it. The latter explains the precepts we must observe in order to possess and preserve the divine life. Ascetic theology gives us, in turn, the means of perfecting it and plainly presupposes the knowledge and the practice of those precepts. It would be indeed a vain and dangerous illusion to neglect the precepts and under the pretext of observing the counsels, to undertake the practice of the highest virtues without having learned to resist temptation and avoid sin. So we come to a false mysticism that way. Third point, with all, ascetical theology is truly a branch of theology distinct from dogma and moral. It has its own proper object. It chooses from among the teachings of our Lord, of the Church, and of, all the, of the saints, all that has reference to the perfection of the Christian life, and so coordinates all these elements as to constitute a real science. Ascetical theology differs from dogma in this that, through grounded upon uh, dogmatic truths, it actually directs these truths towards practice, making us understand, acquire a taste for, and live the life of Christian perfection. It differs from moral theology because while it presents to our consideration the commandments of God and of the Church, which are the basis of all spiritual life, 
It insists also on the evangelical councils and on a higher degree of virtue than is strictly obligatory. Ascetical theology then is truly the science of Christian perfection. Hence, its twofold character, at once speculative and practical. Without uh, doubt, it contains a speculative doctrine, since it goes to dogma when it explains the nature of the Christian life. Yet it is above all, all practical, because it seeks out the means that must be taken to develop that life. In the hands of a wise spiritual counselor, it becomes a, a real art. Here, uh, the art consists in applying the general principles with devotedness and tact to each individual soul. It is uh, the noblest and the most difficult of all arts, Ars Artium Regimen Animarum, um, to rule the souls is the, is the art of the arts. There's a translation of this uh, Latin adagium. The principles and rules which we have uh, given, give, that we shall give, I'm sorry, will help to form good spiritual advices. Then we have here another point to consider, and that is the. Um, What is the difference between uh, ascetical and mystical theology? We have already seen it, but we see it more in detail now. <clears throat> in order to make a distinction between them, we may thus define ascetical theology. That part of spiritual doctrine whose proper object is both the theory and the practice of Christian perfection from its very beginnings up to the threshold of infused contemplation. We place the beginning of perfection in a, in a sincere desire of advancing in the spiritual life. Ascetic theology guides the soul from this beginning through the progative and illuminative ways as for an active contemplation or the simple unitive way. Um, that is its aim, the, through the spiritual limited, limited ways, uh, it reach an active contemplation or the simple unitive way. The mystical theology is that part of spiritual doctrine whose proper object is both the theory and the practice of the contemplative life, which begins with what is called the first night of the senses, described by John of the Cross, Saint John of the Cross, and the prayer of quiet, described by Saint Teresa. We thus avoid defining ascetical theology as the science of the ordinary ways of perfection, and the mystical theology as a science of the extraordinary ways, because that is a false uh, distinction. But our humble opinion. Eh? Nowadays, the word extraordinary is rather reserved to designate a special class of mystical phenomena, such as ecstasies and revelations, which are special gifts, charismata, charims, super added to contemplation. We do not distinguish here between acquired and infused contemplation, so as not to become involved in controversy. Uh, both belong to um, mystical theology. And uh, infused comp contemplation is a consequence, a normal consequence, that God gives um, to one who with his efforts has acquired uh, a con contemplation. A quiet contemplation being as a rule, a preparation, as I said, for infused contemplation, we shall treat it with, when speaking of the unitive way.
we purposely unite in this one treatise both ascetical and mystical theology. Surely there are profound differences between them. These we shall take care to point out later. There is all the same a certain continuity running through these two states, ascetic and mystic, which makes the one a short of a, a sort of I'm sorry, a sort of preparation for the other. The ascetic is a preparation for a mystic. When he sees fit, Almighty God makes his use of the generous dispositions of the ascetic soul and raises it to the mystic states. One thing is certain, the study of the mystical theology throws no little light upon ascetic theology and vice versa. This is because there is a harmony in God's ways. The powerful action which he exercises over mystic souls being so striking, it renders more intelligible the milder influence it exerts over beginners. Thus, the passive trials described by St. John of the Cross make us understand better the ordinary aridity that is experienced in lower stages. Again, we understand better the mystic ways when we see to what degree of docility and adaptability a soul can arrive that has for long years given itself up to be laborious practice, the laborious practices of asceticism. These two parts of one and the same science naturally throw lights on, a, on another and their union is profitable to both. Then, a little word about the sources of ascetical and mystical theology. Since the spiritual science is one of the branches of theology, it has the same sources as the others. We must give the first place to those that contain or interpret the data of revelation, that is, Holy Scripture and tradition. Next, in turn, come the secondary sources, that is, all the knowledge that we acquire through reason, enlightened by faith and experience. Our task is simply to point out the use we can make of them in a sect theology. First, Holy Scripture. We do not find in Holy Scripture a scientific exposition of spiritual doctrine, yet scattered here and there, both in the Old and the New Testaments, we do find the richest data data in the form of teachings, precepts, counsels, prayers, and examples. We, found, we, we find there the speculative doctrines concerning God, his nature, and attributes, his immensity that pervades all things, his infinite wisdom, his goodness and justice, his mercy, his providence, exerts, uh, exercised over all creatures and above all on behalf of man in order to effect their salvation. We find likewise the doctrine concerning God's own life, the mysterious generation of the world, the procession of the Holy Spirit, mutual bonds of union between father and son. Lastly, we find God's works in particular, those wrote for the welfare of man, man's share in the divine, divine life, his restoration after the fall through the incarnation and redemption, his sanctification through the sacraments and the promise of everlasting joys. It's obvious that such sublime teaching is a powerful incentive to an increased love for God and to a greater desire for perfection. As to the moral teachings made up of precepts and counsel, we find the Decalogue, which is summed up in the love of God and one's neighbor. Next comes the high moral teaching of the prophets, 
uh, whoever proclaiming the goodness, the justice and the love of God for his people, turn Israel away from sin and especially from idolatrous practices, whilst at the same time they inculcate into the nation respect and love for God, justice, equity and goodness toward all, towards all, chiefly towards the weak and the oppressed. We are further the sapiential works, books, whose counsels so full of wisdom contain an anticipated exposition of the Christian virtues. Towering above all else, however, stands the wonderful teaching of Jesus. His Sermon on the Mount is a condensed synthesis of asceticism. We find still higher doctrines in his discourses as recorded by St. John and commented upon by the same apostle in his epistles. Finally, there is the spiritual theology of St. Paul, so rich in doctrinal ideas and in practical application. Even the bare summary which we shall give in an appendix to this volume will show that the New Testament is already a code of perfection. We find also in, in Holy Writ prayers to nourish our love and our interior life. Are there any prayers more beautiful than those of the Psalter? 150 psalms given by David, King David, given finally by the Holy Spirit. The church has deemed them to fit to proclaim God's praises and to so adapt to sanctify us that she has incorporated them into her liturgy, the missal and the breviary. Other prayers we also find here and there in the historical and sapiential books. But the prayer of prayers is a Lord's prayer, the most beautiful, the most simple, and in spite of his brevity, the most complete that can be found. Added to this, we have our Lord's sacerdotal prayer, not to mention the doxologies contained in the epistles of St. Paul and in the Apocalypse. Finally, there are the scripture, all the scriptural examples that incite us to practice uh, of virtue. The Old Testament musters before us a whole series of patriarchs, prophets, and other remarkable personages, personages who were not indeed free from weaknesses, yet whose virtues merited the praise of St. Paul and are recounted at length by the fathers the church fathers who proposed them to us for imitation. Who would not admire the piety of Abel and Enoch, the steadfastness of Noe, who wrote, wrote good in the midst of a corrupt generation? Who would not pay homage to the faith and trust of Abraham, the chastity and prudence of Joseph, the courage, the wisdom and the constancy of Moses, the fearless zeal, devotion, and wisdom of David, who would not admire the austerity of life in the prophets, the heroic conduct of the Maccabees, and countless other examples. In the New Testament is, of course, Jesus Christ, who appears as the ideal type of sanctity. Next, Mary and Joseph, his faithful imitators, then the apostles, who, imperfect as they were at first, gave themselves up so completely in body and soul to the preaching of the gospel and to the practice of the Christian and apostolical virtues, that their lives cry out to us even louder than their words. Be ye followers of me as I am also of Christ. If some of these holy ones uh, had their faults, the manner in which they redeemed them adds greater word to their example for it shows us how we can, by penance, atone for our faults. Then tradition. Tradition completes holy writ. It hands down to us truths which are not contained in the latter. More, it interprets scripture with authority. It is known to us by the solemn and ordinary teaching of the church. 
In the, the solemn teaching consists chiefly in the definitions of councils and sovereign pontiffs. It has, be, it has but rarely concerned itself, it is true, with questions, ascetical or mystical, properly so-called. Yet it has often had to come to the, to the fore in order to clear up and define those truths that form the basis of the science of perfection, to wit, God's life considered at the source, the elevation of man to a supernatural state, original sin and its consequences, the redemption, grace communicated to generate man, to generated man, merit, which increases in our souls the divine life, the sacraments that impart grace, the holy sacrifice of mass, in which the fruits of redemption are applied, in the course of our study, we shall have to make use of all these definitions. Then the ordinary teaching of the church is exercised in two ways, theoretically and practically. The theoretical teaching is given us first in a negative way, by the condemnation of the proposition of false mystics. Secondly, in a positive manner, in the common doctrine of the church fathers and theologians, or in the conclusions that follow from the lives of saints. False mystics have at different times altered the true notion of Christian perfection. Such were the Anglicists and the, Mon the Montanists in the first centuries, the Fraticelli and the Begins and or Begots of the Middle Ages, Molinos and the Quietists in modern times. By condemning them, the church has pointed out to us the, the rocks we must avoid and mark the course to which we must hold. On the other hand, the common doctrine has uh, gradually evolved from all those major questions that make up the living commentary of biblical teaching. This doctrine is found in the church fathers, the theologians and spiritual writers. In reading them, we are impressed with their agreements on all vital points that have reference to the nature of perfection, the necessary means of arriving thereat, and the principal stage of be, uh, to be followed. Doubtless, there remain a few controverted points, but these concern secondary uh, questions. Their very discussion simply brings into relief uh, the moral unanimity that exists with regard to the rest. The tacit approval which the church gives to this common teaching is for the safe guarantee of truth. The practical teachings is to be found chiefly in the process of the canonization of the saints who have taught and practiced the whole of these spiritual doctrines. We are all, are, are all acquainted with the meticulous care exercised both in the revision of their writings and in the scrutiny of their virtues. It is easy to find out from the study of these documents just what principles of spirit spirituality are the expression of the church mind with regard to the nature and the means of perfection. This can be clearly seen by perusing the, learn, the learned work of Benedict XIV entitled De Servorum de Beatificatione et Canonizatione, or some of the process of canonization, or even by readings of biographies of the saints written according to the rules of sound criticism. Then we have the reason enlightened by faith and uh, experience. Human reason is a gift of God, absolutely indispensable to man for the, the attainment of truth, whether natural or supernatural. It plays a very important role in the study of spirituality just as it does in the study of the other ecclesiastical sciences. When it is question, however, of revealed truth, it needs to be guarded and complete, complemented 
by the light of fates. And in the application of general principles to souls, it must look for help to psychological experience also. Its first task, first task is that of gathering, interpreting, and setting in order the teachings of scripture and tradition. These are scattered through many books and need to be put together if they are to form one consistent whole. Besides, the sacred utterances were pronounced under diverse circumstances, elicited by particular questions spoken to different hearers. In the same way, circumstances of time and place are often responsible for the texts of tradition. Therefore, in order to grasp their meaning, we must needs place them in their proper setting, harmonize them with analogous teachings, and lastly, arrange them and inter interpret them in the light of the sum total of Christian truths. Once this first work is done, we must draw conclusions from these principles, show their legitimacy, legitimacy and their manifold applications to the thousands and one details of human life in its most varied situations. situations. Lastly, these principles and conclusions will be coordinated into one vast synthesis and thus will constitute a real science. It is likewise the work of reason to defend ascetical doctrine against its detractors. Many attack it in the name of reason and science, seeing nothing but illusion in what embodies sublime, uh, sublime reality. It is in the, in the province of reason to make answer to such crit criticisms with the aid of philosophy and science. Spirituality is a science that is lived. It is important, therefore, to show historically how it has been carried out in practice. This requires the reading of the biographies of the saints, both ancient and modern, who lived in diverse countries and under different conditions. Thus, we make sure of the way in which ascetical rules were interpreted when adapted to different epochs and peoples and to pe peculiar duties of states. More, since the members of the church are not all holy, we must be thoroughly acquainted with the obstacles encountered in the practice of perfection and with the means employed to surmount them. Psychological studies then are paramount and to reading must be a joint observation. Third point, it is further a task of reason enlightened by faith to apply principles and general rules to each person in particular. In this account must be taken of the individual temperament, character, sex and age, social standing, duties of state, as well as of the supernatural attractions of grace. One must also be mindful of the rules governing the discernment of spirits. In order to fulfill this threefold role, it is not only necessary to possess a, kind, a keen mind, but also a sound judgment and great tact and discernment. One must add to this the study of practical psychology, the study of temperaments, of nervous ailments and morbid conditions, which exert such a great influence over mind and will. Then, since it is a question of supernatural science, one must not forget that the light of faith plays a predominant part and that it is the gifts of the Holy Spirit that brings this science to its supreme, supreme perfection.
This is true in particular of the gift of knowledge, which makes us rise even up to God, of the gift of understanding, which gives us a deeper insight into the truths of faith, of the gift of wisdom, which enables us to discern and relish these truths, of the gifts of counsel that gives us skill to apply them to each individual case. Thus, it is that the saints who allow themselves to be led by the Spirit of God are the best fitted to understand and the best to apply the principles of the spiritual life. They have a sort of instinct for divine things, a kind of second nature that enables them to grasp them more readily and to relish them more. Do hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them to the little ones, said uh, uh, God in Matthew 11th chapter. So next time we will see um, we will speak about the practical methods to be followed in our study of the spirituality. Ask some questions? No questions? So, this conference will be uh, uh, put on my YouTube chain. And you can, as a former apostolate, uh, send it to people, persons who are um, supposed to be interested by this. Um, because there's a great need for the souls uh, to reach their, uh, the goal wherefore they has been, have been uh, created. So, let us end with another prayer. <clears throat> in the name of the Father, the Son, of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Amen. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now at the hour of death. Amen. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Our guardian angels, pray for us. All the holy patrons, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.